Okay, we're here. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another of our series of healing conversations. And I am thrilled that my friend Eric Pearl is here with me today. Now, Dr. Eric Pearl almost needs no introduction. Um, he is a renowned healer. He was a chiropractor who was minding his own business. Um, and all of a sudden, discovered that he was healing people before he put his hands on them. And that went on and on. And he then tried to figure out what it was he had accessed. And in doing so, created the reconnection. And he teaches people around the world how to heal. And what I love about what he does is he's not full of techniques. He didn't call in all kinds of um, spiritual beings, etc. He found out what kind of power exists within us that we can access. So welcome, Dr. Pearl. It's great to see you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for having me. I, I want to start off with, uh, with um, what I mentioned um, just with the smaller audience that um, Jillian very much apologizes for not being able to be here. We have uh, a caretaker issue who, um, well, was delayed and she had to fill in, which brings us to that wonderful expression. She has that flexibility is, <laughs> especially during this time, is the highest form of grace. So thank you all for being flexible. I love that. That is so with that. And I, and I want to comment on, on what you had just mentioned when we said without bringing in the entities and the candles and the crystals and the wands and the this and the that. Um, I fortunately didn't know enough to go down that road. You know, um, as I had been practicing as a chiropractor, what I had not been was um, studying energy healing techniques. I didn't study Reiki and Qigong and all the various forms, the old ones and the new ones. And so I didn't know, quote unquote, that we were supposed to protect ourselves uh, or, or use this or use it. So I didn't have those fears or insecurities that I wasn't enough or that something could happen. And fortunately, that allowed me to just walk in as heart, soul, and being. And we'll, we'll talk about it a little differently in a minute. But um, it was only later when I started thinking all these people must know something that I don't that I started looking and they started saying, you know, do this for protection, do this to make you more, do this to make the healing better. And as I did those things, the healings came down. They went from way up here by being the natural essence of who you and I are before we attempt to add on, before we attempt to gild the lily. And in that gilding with all those to-dos, it came down and only when I realized that I was feeling really burdened by worrying about if I should go clockwise or counterclockwise or do this or put that in this corner in the room and that in the other. And I started releasing them, but the healings came back up. And in that realization, we discovered that it really is our essence. And so the funny thing that that relates to is what Jillian and I speak about as the before beyond. You know, we're all so busy trying to see what will take us further. What can help us move beyond where we are, beyond this, beyond that. And the funny thing is, is that beyond that we're looking for, it came and is always, it came before we started trying to move beyond. It, it's what we covered up with the additions. So what really we're looking for in a moving of what's next is really by coming back to the what always was, the energy, the light, the information, call it God or love or the intelligence of the universe, call it Helen for all that matters, is the always, how we experience it, how we choose to do it, the experience, even the experience of reconnective healing, the experience of anything, the experience of ourselves, of you as a woman, as me as a man, or our dogs as <laughs> dogs, um, is finite. The energy, light, and information is infinite. 
And when we turn the infinite into experience of do it this way, that way, steps and procedures, fears and protections, we turn it into maybe beautiful finites, but into finites. And I think what we're here to discover is how to be the, how to return to that before beyond is, um, is the infinite that we are. Absolutely. And I think that whole idea of that we're already this is where our work really intersects. And for those of you on Dr. Pearl's Facebook page, you don't know who I am. Um, I'm Lynn McTaggart. Um, <clears throat> I'm an author. I've written a number of books that bridge science and spirituality. You may know me about um, from the field because I think Eric talks about that book a lot. I think if you I know really reconnective healing and if you heard Jillian or I speak or present before, then I believe Lynn that they know Lynn McTaggart, if only for <laughs> one of my favorite books, The Field. And Lynn has written many other books. She's written The Intention Experiment. She's written The Bond. Oh. But I am a true lover of The Field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Eric does mention it all the time, for which I am very, very grateful. But perhaps the part you don't know, or anybody who's out there, is that my journey about healing was also a bit of an accident. Um, I'm a writer. I mean, that's what I do. I'm a writer. I'm an investigative reporter. And um, I wanted to test the power of intention because I'd seen a lot of evidence in the field that thoughts are an actual something with the capacity to change physical matter. So the investigative reporter in me said, well, how far can we take this? And that's why I set up the intention experiment. I wanted to see if thoughts can cure cancer and not just shift quantum particles. So we started doing that. We've run 35 to date. 31 have shown measurable, positive, mostly significant effects. Everything from trying to make seeds grow faster to purifying water to lowering violence in war-torn areas. But it was just in trying to scale it down in a workshop back in 2008 that I put people into small groups thinking, let's I don't know how to scale this down. Maybe I'll have them send some sort of healing intention to a member of the group with a health challenge. So we did that, not knowing what we were doing, and we got these amazing healings. I'll show you one later uh, of a woman who got out of a wheelchair. We have it on, on video. But what I'm really talking about was what Eric found too, which I think is really essential, which is, that this already exists in you. And for me, my work is all about doing it in small groups and trying to quantify it and trying to see what, what works and what doesn't work and, and noting what goes on with people and teaching them the power of doing this together. And so that's, that's, where, that's where my work has taken me really almost by accident and shockingly so. And as you say, Eric, I didn't study of any of those things. There are certain things we have found work better than others. And so when I first met that. you, I was going to say, when I first met you, Lynn, you were not yet really, I believe, involved in the healing aspect of it. I, I believe you were more involved in the research. Oh, the totally. I, and nor did I ever mean to be a healer for this, I discovered this back in 2008, and it took me 10 years and a lot of bullying by my husband, Brian, to even write The Power of Eight, because I kept saying to him, I'm not a healer, I'm not a healer. And he said, he kept telling me, and I said, I'm doing these intention experiments. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And he said, what's the most amazing part of the intention experiments? And that's another thing we were starting to quantify. We were surveying people from 2008, and we found people who participated in peace intention experiments, their life became more peaceful. They, um, they made up with estranged partners. They got along better with their uh, not so nice bosses. Um, they started being in love with everybody they come into contact with. That in our surveys, 40% said that. Um, you know, they were hugging strangers. So this was shocking to me 
And I, I started realizing that the act of participation in this as a kind of group, call it a group prayer, a, a secular group prayer was the thing that was changing people. And so it's, it's been too in the groups, we've seen the senders receive as much as the receivers. So no, er Eric, I never meant to do this. I am still, if somebody asks me what I do, I'm a writer. Um, and you're a researcher. And, and I'm a researcher. All, and we're all researchers, whether or not we follow the standard scientific research protocol or, um, um, you know how they say, well, everyone just has anecdotal evidence and a lot of anecdotal evidence isn't science. But I mean, even just the other night in listening to um, researchers talking, I mean, they're the first to admit that all research begins with anecdotal evidence and, totally. and totally. supposition or theory, something to explore, not with evidence. And we often tend to forget, as you and I say all the time, is that um, the evidence is always there. If, if, if everything didn't exist before science discovered it, science wouldn't have anything to discover. And, you know, um, I mean, I, I think that's really important for us to know. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and you know, anecdotes, there are, there's a thing in science called a case study, where a scientist or a uh, medical researcher will report on an individual or a group of individuals who have had this particular change after, say, taking a drug. And that's considered scientific. So anecdote is fine. Because, you know, it's like with our peace intention experiments, Eric. If we have one, you know, we did our first one with Sri Lanka and we showed a, you know, a, a big change and the war, 25 year war, a few months after our in peace intention experiment that had been going nowhere, was intractable, was over. Yeah. Did we do this? Short answer, of course, who knows? You know, there's so many other variables, but if you run seven of them or eight of them or 10 of them or whatever, and you keep getting the same result, then you've got something interesting. So by the same token, anecdotes in this case, uh, in your case, are of course valid. And here's the other interesting thing about it, which is um, when you start quantifying it, which we have done, you know, we keep looking at it and looking at it, what is, you know, is this working again and again and again? Does it work all the time? No. Same thing with reconnective healing. I know you know sometimes it isn't working. So I think for both of us, what we're both saying is we've discovered a capacity humans have that is not discussed in the ordinary scientific literature, which is discounted from the time you're a child, you probably know this when you were a very small child, but it's discounted. And so both of us, what I think marks us both is that we're trying to give this back to people to demonstrate how powerful they really are. I think you've just opened a very interesting door for discussion for this group, which is when you said, does it work all the time? Because I remember when um, people used to ask me about reconnective healing, they'd say, does it work all the time? Or what's the percentage of the time that it works? And I answered in that same thought process, oh, about 70% of the time, and that was good. But you know what I came to discover? It works 100% of the time. It's just that about 70% of the time, people receiving reconnective healing would look for the result that they had in mind coming in, and that's where I was looking at the time. I didn't know better yet. And later we would discover the other healings that we weren't looking at, that we didn't know about that came about. But it's that thing about working or, or just the judgment of, was it a good healing? Was it a bad healing? Did it work? Did it not work? That is very, very result oriented. I believe that the changes that came about, if you use the Sri Lanka wars or if you use any, any concept at all, really is because of all of us at whatever level we're functioning. It's because of our awareness, our attention. And when we talk about the um, 
healers, um, the recipients received and the healers receive, everyone is receiving. And that's another consciousness for us to understand. I believe we step out of this picture of comprehension when we start to view ourselves as senders because you can't send if we don't receive. We can't inhale, exhale if we don't inhale. We have to place the oxygen masks on ourselves on the airplane if you're still flying right now, um, before we start placing it on, on the people around us. And therefore, we tend to, what I've observed is that a lot of people tend to confuse, did the healing work with did we get the results that we in our limited human educated personality and ego driven minds determine should be the healing? I mean, obviously, if an older woman walks in and she's got difficulty moving without a walker or a cane and her hips in a lot of pain, yes, she wants the pain to go away. She wants to walk. We want that as our nature, as our heart. And if that doesn't happen, do we wanna say the healing didn't work or do we wanna step back a few meters or yards and say, maybe this perfect intelligence of God, love in the universe, this energy, light and information said, there is a higher form of what let's consider evolution or healing for that person to experience right now that may or may not lead into what's in the desired capacity, according to human perspective, and yet there may well be more to the picture than we see. There may be the unseen. There may be that something was going on that was um, cancerous in our system or something else and that was handled, but we don't see that. And then we confuse what we see with what actually happened or what we see within the time frame of our communication with what actually happen. I mean, I remember way back in the beginning, one of my first, you know, upsets with this or shocks or something was a woman who came in because she had that problem with walking and she had a very nice healing session. She wrote me the nastiest letter. It was so nasty. I could hardly hold it when I was reading it. I didn't want to throw it away. I didn't want someone to find it. I didn't have a shredder at the time. I didn't want it in her file. I didn't want anyone to see it. It was so ugly. How could you take money? How could you do this? How could you do that? Da, 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 da. I finally put it not only behind her file, but in the back of the file drawer where it could get <laughs> lost and only I knew where it was if I ever wanted to see it. Do you know that a month or two later, I bump into this woman, she's laughs, she smiles. I'm thinking, oh my God, what happened? She said, yeah, I was in the supermarket a few days later and a friend bumped into me and said, hey, where's your cane? I was so happy. Did she write me back? Oops, I'm sorry, no. So you know what happened? I felt like crap because of that. I felt awful because I inside was taking credit for something that I couldn't take credit for. And therefore I felt responsible for something I wasn't responsible for. And on top of that, it was all based on a false goal of did they get the result they were looking for? And I equated that was with was the healing good or bad? Did it work or did it not work? And absolutely none of that was accurate. But it, here's a really interesting point you just brought up. And I think that is a kind of crux of it, which is this whole idea of I do it. You know, I do it whether it is the healer or it is the recipient and it worked. Well, she did get better. She didn't have her cane anymore. That's the interesting thing. But the, the problem was, as you say, is feeling responsible. I should feel responsible for this. And I think this brings up a really important point as to whether or not people get better. What I see is there is no one person responsible because it's a group, it's a small group. But here's the really interesting point of it that you brought up, everybody is a sender, because oftentimes the really remarkable healing effects I see are when people are senders, not to the recipient, but for themselves. One of the great, I'm gonna show everybody this video of a woman getting out of her wheelchair, but I want to tell you before him that what happened to her when I, I was so astounded by what happened. This was at the end of a talk um, and I'm 
at the end of the talk, I put people into groups, have them do a healing intention to, as a group to some member of the group with some sort of issue. And if anyone experiences something, I have them raise their hand and talk about it. And the last group, they all raised their hand and pointed to Maya. And Maya gets up out of her wheelchair. And I was remarked, I was just, she was paralyzed from the neck down. And I was just blown away by this. And I've seen many, many healings since 2008, but this one took the cake. And I asked her, what do you think was the thing? I called her up afterward because I wanted to find out, well, what happened to you? And she said, well, she felt more love than she ever had before. And in that moment, it was too much. She didn't need it. And so she passed on some to a relative of hers who had cancer. And I, in that moment, she said she felt the wheels of her wheelchair go through the floor. And it was that moment as a sender. And I've heard that over and over again. People are stuck. Um, people like um, uh, a woman called Andy, who was stuck, couldn't get a job, was working. Um, she was working at, with a gift shop. She sold her gift shop. She needed a job, couldn't find one. She was trying to get a new job in marketing. Um, ends up um, uh, just not getting anywhere. So I finally just said in a fit of frustration, she was in a year long master class of mine with a group where I put people into groups for a whole year and ask them to work with each other while they, they get teaching from me. I just said, Andy, get off of yourself. Start intending for someone else. And she did, the moment she did, she gets a call out of nowhere from someone offering her a dream job. And that has happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. So I think what is really important is the healer not being responsible, feeling responsible, and the healy, as you say, sometimes disengaging from the outcome and just opening yourself up to love and connection and then see what happens. And I think that disengaging is very key, the disengagement consciously. Um, and, and I think for clarity for everyone, you know, Lynn and I go about some things very differently, both equally effectively. You know, Lynn has a lot of focus on intention and we have a lot of focus on attention. It's, there's a little bit of a variation and, and you know, many roads lead to Rome. Um, I might suggest that it's not maybe so much as the healer being responsible by themselves and then responsibility being of the group as maybe there's not responsibility on that level. Maybe there's an accountability to interact, but I think responsibility becomes something that our personality takes on. I think when we start to feel responsibility either as an individual or a group, it indicates that we have been, as an individual or a group, accepting credit. Oh, this person could this, this person could that. I did a good job, we did a good job. And it's very, very costly when credit is um, accepted for something that takes place on another level because of our presence. I, 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 I said in, in, in my first book, In the Reconnection, I said, and for those of us um, who remember the, the 60s, um, the high is not worth the crash, you know? Um, the high of going, look what I've done, look what we've done, isn't worth what happens because then when a different result comes about that we're not even aware of, we start to feel a guilt and a responsibility. That, that's a very expensive thing. And I think part of what opened my eyes a little bit was, um, oh, I remember one of the first people who came in for the Reconnective Healing Experience, and I was still looking at it as a thing, as the healing. Um, and they came in and they said, it didn't work, nothing happened. But the strangest thing is going on in my life. Everyone 
who was always throwing up roadblocks for years for me at the office, suddenly became so open and so friendly. I wonder what happened to those people. Nothing happened to them. Mm. It's, it's a bigger picture. And if that person didn't notice it, they could have said, oh, nothing happened, didn't go away. And, and I could have gotten lost in that same delusion of there was no healing. Instead, it allowed me to begin to open my eyes. So I'm going to come back a little bit to the before beyond. Um, this energy, light, and information has it is infinite. It's always been here. But we have experiences of it. And experiences of it become a little more finite. And in some form, though not limited just to a box, because from each experience, we grow. The person you're talking about grew. Um, people I'm talking about grew and an expanded consciousness, awareness, evolutionary, something comes in and gets carried through a, a new flavor of, of wonder to their life. And we can actually bring this, we bring the reconnective healing frequencies and this awareness into our lives as we move on and continue in, in, in our evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it's, it's not just a body mind, you know, it's not no, just a mind. It's not a body mind. This is the thing, you know, people, although I do want to say about something and just pick up on what, what you said. Um, one of the things that distinguishes people, for instance, who have spontaneous healing from cancer, um, work of Kelly Turner, who is a researcher who looked at spont cases of spontaneous remission in her book about that. And she found there were nine essentials for people where cancer just went away. And only two of them had to do with physical elements like changing your diet or taking supplements. Everything else had to do with mental, emotional, spiritual changes. So people made changes. And I think that it's important when we talk about responsibility, one of the key elements is taking responsibility in my view um, uh, for change. Now that can take many, many um, forms and it's about opening yourself up to a, a different way of being, a different way of thinking, a different way of feeling. Um, any one of those can change, but for instance, with Kelly Turner, she found, as I say, that what was really important was things like community. What was really important was spirituality. What was really important was taking responsibility for your life and taking control of your life in the sense of saying, I am, you know, I'm responsible. I'm not just blown away. I can choose what I do with my life. And those kinds of areas with that emphasis on a bigger spiritual experience or a community connection are things that I find really, really important. Like another thing you said that I think is really key here, Eric, when we talk about, and, and, and as Eric says, we have different ways of getting here. And I also wanna say for any of the Reiki masters out there listening or anybody else, there are many roads that lead to Rome and we're not denigrating anybody else's healing no. techniques. Um, and Eric and I have very, very different situations. As you say, ours is group-based and we do really focus on uh, what we're thinking and what we're sending out there based on a lot of the work that I do and in the master classes I hold. Ours is all about the power of community to heal and the power of group intention to heal. But and one thing I think very vital. Yeah, which is, you know, we're, as I say, we're just two different strands of what we're trying to do, which is access human capability that exists already. One of the things that in trying to parse, okay, what experiences 
make it more likely that people will have a healing. And as you say, that bigger definition of healing isn't necessarily what they focused, that they thought they needed, but their life may be healed. But what you, what you talked about um, and what happens in, with your reconnective healing, I found there are experiences in terms of an alteration of consciousness that happen certainly with our power of eight groups. Um, I was fascinated to look at, oh, works by people like Andrew Greeley, who wrote a book called Ecstasy. And he talked about peak experiences or states, mystical experiences. And he talked about altered states of consciousness, alterations in thinking, a disturbed time sense, loss of control, changes in emotional expression, things like that, change in body um, images, visualizations, just all kinds of hallucinations even. But the point is um, two important things happened, I think, with a kind of mystical experience. And we've certainly seen that with power of eight groups and we've measured brain waves during power of eight sessions and found that the parts of the brain involved in feeling separate, the parietal lobes, which sit right here, the frontal, right frontal lobe, which is um, part of that executive function, but the part that is involved with worry, doubt, negativity, also dialed way down. One of, what we found is two important things that happen both in the intention experiments and these power of eight groups is a sense of big, big change, a sense of the ineffable, you know, the sense of something bigger than themselves, a sense of oneness, um, a sense of rejuvenation, and a, sometimes this kind of blinding epiphany and meaning, you know, life makes sense. Lots of that seems to be recorded over and over and over again. And what I think is really important about this in terms of a sense of, of what it takes to heal is that feeling of oneness. And really, Eric, when, you've, when I've seen you do reconnective healing, you are in a state of oneness with the healee. He is in a state of oneness with you. Your boundaries have been crossed. That may not have been a conscious intention, but you're there. You're in an altered state. We can't hear you right now. Yeah, I got it. sorry. And that's very important because with reconnective healing, it takes place beyond body mind. Um, people haven't made changes. They haven't changed their thought process or their perspective, nor have they changed their diet, nor have I intended certain things to occur, nor that remember when reconnective healing first came about, you got to realize my patients were coming in to say a chiropractor and I thought I was one. I mean, you really can't double blind to study much more than that. You know, no one prepared, expected anything else. They were coming in one day, like they were coming into my office the week before for chiropractic. And all of a sudden these healings started happening. So there was no nine steps or 12 steps or, or four qualities that bring about a healing or this, that, and the other, it just was. So when like with Gary Schwartz and, 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 um, a lot of the other researchers that we work with, yes, they've done studies and they looked at which parts of the brains are affected, this, that, and the other. And all, there was a lot of consistency for certain areas. And there was also a lot of uniqueness and individuality as they went through their experience. So the funny thing is, is that something higher, I'll use that word, it's, it's a little linear, but something beyond body mind, the before beyond, takes over and allows us to be. Um, and I believe that we don't just do healing or even, you know, facilitate healing or send a healing, at least with reconnective healing, we become the healing. We become the healing. The facilitator becomes the healing the client becomes the healing and suddenly 
the how to's kind of show themselves from reconnective healing experiences anyway, as the illusion of how we thought, and see thinking isn't even a part of this, that we got there. Instead, we truly become not even the witness and the witness, the seer and the seen, the observer and the observed, because even in that there's separation, there's the subject and there's the object. We become observation itself, witnessing itself, healing itself. And it's a hard thing to explain because our language is linear. And when we can't explain it fully because of the words not really existing for us in, 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 in the way language is laid out in any language today, um, the ego gets a little annoyed. And so we look for explanation so we feel better and sound better about ourselves. It's just like the nameless. When, when the energy, light, and information appeared, it was infinite. So being infinite, there's no box for it to fit in, which means there's no name. Because when we name something, anything, we place it into a box and we say everything in that box is it and everything outside that box is not. And there were two things I definitely knew. I didn't know what this was and I definitely didn't know what it wasn't. And um, what happens is when we're willing to accept that we don't know, we see potentials growing and growing and growing and we grow within that. So um, I wouldn't name this for the longest time and human nature couldn't take it. So people in the Northeast of the US called it one name and in the Southeast, they called it something else. And they always wanted Eric Pearl or Pearl attached and high healing and natural healing and this healing and that healing. Um, human nature has a problem with the infinite. And yet maybe the infinite is here showing itself to us to allow for the growth of human nature so that we may grow into the infinite beings that we are by our very nature, which tends to sort of release a lot of the how-to, I think. It does. I think where we're sort of getting to is I think there have to be certain conditions that where we've created them. You've created them with certain things you show people how to do. We've created it by putting people into groups. But as you said, there's some sort of merging with something beyond um, that cannot be explained. And that was really, the conclusion I got to, although I could set up, it's almost like putting the cup out and hoping it'll get filled. That's essentially what we do, both of us in one way or another. Um, what I did find that is the most interesting part of my master classes are the people who say, I when I put people into groups for a year, I teach them, various things about setting up groups and how they use intention and how they do that to heal different parts of their lives. And then I monitor people week by week to find out what happens to them. The journalist in me always wants to find out as well as try to help. And the most fascinating thing of all has been what people report happens while they're in a state of doing this healing, power of eight healing intention. More times than I can, uh, I can describe, they've said things like, there was a light being of sorts, um, some sort of light being standing behind all of our chairs. This is when people met in person, like they were the magnifiers. We were doing the healing, but they were the magnifiers. There was someone else who said she had a real problem with her knee and was um, having a hard time walking, was due for an operation. She was wobbling as she walked. And this is just one little 10 minute intention, group intention. She stood up and did a full squat, but also here's the interesting bit. She said things like, it felt like somebody with large mitts was holding my knee. And now everybody was in a circle holding hands. Nobody was touching her knee. And over and over again, particularly among empaths, I hear about this 
light beings or something bigger. And this is really in the front of my mind because I just watched something on near-death experiences, which have been always been of great interest to me. Um, I, I like to collect near-death experience stories and coma stories. And I'm particularly fascinated by the fact, not just the light in the tunnel and all of that, but the fact that they are completely conscious and observing themselves when they're in a state where their brain is completely flatlining. Um, and that it just demonstrates one more example that consciousness is not you know, encased in our bodies. Um, so I think it's that kind of really interesting part, Eric, the part that is demonstrating that, yeah, this is, there is something bigger here. And can we, you know, can we describe it? Probably not. We can only, I guess, experience it. Sorry, I know my sound clicks off. Um, I'm wondering, really, as I look at this, because I do remember in the beginning and, and yeah, it's not our focus. So I don't tend to chat about it a lot. Um, and this still goes on, but it was one of the first thing I noticed that yes, a lot of the times um, the clients saw beings and felt beings. And, and to this day, people feel sometimes pressure or weight or hand on them or feather or this, that, and the other. Are they magnifiers? Or is this just our awareness of being observed? I tend to believe that we are standing on the precipice of the next level of human evolution. And I believe that's what the energy light and information is bringing us to our next level of human evolution. And we experience it through when, when we do this through the reconnective healing experience, it's an experience of this. I believe that we exist on multiple levels, multiple facets. Um, and we say, oh, look, there's an angel over there. There's a Pleiadian over there. There's a ghost over there. There's a garden, guardian angel over here, this, that, and the other in separation. I believe that we're all having our different experiences. Humanity is having this one. And all of the universe is always aware of all of the universe. And there is observation. We are being observed. Here's humanity in its evolution. And we're, we're not being necessarily so much taken somewhere as much as being observed as we grow. So I do believe that there is, but it's easy to get lost in the excitement of the phenomena. Ooh, will an angel come? Will they talk? Will they say, what's this flower I'm smelling? What's this, what's that? And it happens with reconnective healing just as it happens with um, the, you know, the, the power of eight, just as it happens in many different things. Many of us are learning different ways to become aware of this. And really, I think it's us. Really, I believe we can access this within us individually because really what we're accessing is us. We are this, we are the before, beyond. We are energy, light, and information. And energy, light, and information, I believe is experiencing itself through us. I remember when um, I listened to Neil Donald Walsh talk a little bit and, and I was trying to follow what he was saying when he was speaking about um, how um, God is experiencing self through us. Humans are having their experiences to bring back. And I thought, well, yes, but if God or by whatever name we use it is infinite, why would we be required to have this experience to bring back if it's already infinite? And yet when we look at this, can the infinite, being infinite, experience the finite unless 
we allow ourselves in finite to experience this and then bring it back to the infinite because in being infinite, you're not finite, which almost sounds like a contradiction because the infinite is everything, but then if the infinite is everything, then it can't be finite, can it? And I throw that one back to you, Lynn. <laughs> That's a good one, Eric. Uh, I think the bottom line is, you know, we are um, corporeal beings um, having an experience and here to learn. And what we don't understand, and we also are defined and limited by our own self-definition and our own self-definition is mainly created through science. You know, science writes the story we live by and science, the science we've had up until now is a story of separation, of lack of competition, of very well-behaved objects operating according to fixed laws in time and space and separate objects. And don't underestimate the limiting power of that description, that self-description to divorce us from the infinite and from these abilities. And that is the real problem. We come into the world we are told, you know, we probably as children experience this on a regular basis. But then we're told over and over and over again, no, that's, that's just an imaginary friend, or that's not this, or that's not that. And then suddenly we believe it, and we are disempowered. And we don't understand that we do hold the infinite in our hands, always. And so... I think what you are doing, what we try to do is to hand this back to people and to show them that they do have this power. This power resides within you. And we may be locked down here. We may have certain freedoms removed at the moment for good or for ill, but we may be in the midst of this pandemic, but this is one thing no one can take away from you or me or all of us because we have this, we already have this power. So as you say, we are, you know, how come we feel this because we should feel infinite? Well, we are these finite, self-defined and self-limited beings having this experience. And we, what we have to do, the real thing we have to do is define ourselves in a new way, write a new scientific story, which is the work I try to do. Or the infinite is experiencing itself through us in this finite form. It's yes. It's an yes. you know. Yes, absolutely. You no, know, maybe I mean that's that's a purpose that we don't always look at for our existence, and I think part part of what. I found with reconnective healing is that when we receive, whether it's this awareness, whether it's the energy, light, and information, as it plays with us, when we receive, we can't receive by ourselves. So our receiving is everyone's receiving, just as when you look at Nassim Haramein and others explaining um, what goes on in one proton affects every proton in the universe. And when we're busy sending sometimes, at least this is the way I speak about reconnective healing. I say, when we're sending the healing, we're creating or reinforcing the illusion of separation because you can't send unless you're one place and something else is another place. Yet receiving can be a receiving that is shared by everyone, which changes the field, which affects everyone. And we have a lot of guilt around receiving. We think of receiving we, we think of receiving as taking instead of recognizing that receiving is the growth that allows everyone to grow. And in doing that, you know what we're really doing is we're dissolving otherness, that separation. For example, when people experience reconnective healing and their bodies go into involuntary movements of different kinds, what we call the registers, it's a representation of the dissolving of separation, the dissolving of otherness. And what is the dissolving of otherness other than 
healing? What's the dissolving of otherness than planetary healing, than healing between countries that keep seeing each other as others when you talk about some of your work you know, in, in the Middle East or, or Sri Lanka or here, there, and the other? What we're really doing is we're taking everyone who is one and the same and showing them that because the wars have been because they've been viewing themselves as others and others and separation brings about a concept of fear and fear causes us to protect them. And we're not sure that we can't protect them. We go out and we kill. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It is about ultimate connection and not feeling separated. Um, and so really what we're both getting to, I think, is changing some of the language around healing too, changing some of the expectation. One thing I will say that is a big part of the work that I do, and that's probably why the groups, the small groups are so powerful, so effective, is that there is an element of, of altruism involved. There is also a trading of giving and receiving. So sometimes you are the recipient, sometimes you are doing the sending, um, but the point is everybody is receiving, always, all at the same time. Wonderful example was, well, I see in my master class this year, we have groups where it, we had a fascinating story of one woman who had cancer in one ear and she couldn't, she, she went deaf from the radiotherapy she, she had. And so the group kind of took turns having her do some sending, having her do some receiving and while they looked at a picture of a perfect ear and <clears throat> she's now fine, she could, <laughs> and it was a great story because she found out she was fine because the phone rang and she had it on that ear and she actually heard it. But I've heard many, many stories of people who have traded off giving and receiving and during the time they were a sender, like a guy called Wes, who was a Vietnam vet, uh, who was in a state of terrible depression since the Vietnam War. So for many, many years, he was 65 when I met him. And he just participated in one 10 minute power of eight group where he was, a, he was one of the senders to a woman with stage four cancer. And the next day he had had terrible depression and felt like essentially there was no reason for him to carry on. What's the use? It was hard for him to even get up in the morning. And after this experience, he had this dream where he actually dreamed he met his 19 year old self at university where he had been studying to be a biochemist or a doctor. And he had quit after he got drafted into the Vietnam War. Terrible story of just, just a life just spiraling downward. And he had this sense of his 19 year old self, not an actual statement, but saying to him, don't worry, there's still time. And it, he was like Scrooge on Christmas morning after that. He was waking up, he woke up, he was saying hi to everybody. This was somebody who was a, studiously avoiding people. And Karen, you know, was just suddenly fell back in love with his life. And it had nothing to do with him receiving anything except he received everything. So it, I think for us, one of the, the real conditions that has happened over and over again is giving, and I've done a lot of research on giving, and giving actually is receiving. So what you say is quite profound, Eric, because what we've seen is, number one, people have a need to give. It's not um, just a nice thing to do. We have a need, it's pretty essential for humans to give. We also have a natural impulse to give. It's just, we're hardwired into it. And when I look at the science of altruism, I find that people who do stuff for other people, however small, live longer, happier, healthier lives. So I think part of this giving and receiving thing is, you know, and we have been so conditioned in the personal development 
I, um, uh, programs to self-help. And I think what's really interesting is the real power of other help. And I think that is probably what goes on in healing. Now, shall we take some questions? We've got a load of people who have been writing some questions up we, here. We, we do, but right before we take the first, I have to answer one of the questions I saw in the chat. Sure, go ahead. What is, what is that blue water Dr. Pearl has been drinking? It's Pleiadian healing water. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a little vitamin C powder <laughs> mixed and it turns blue. We tend to make everything seem so mystical. It's just blue. So <laughs> it's to go with your glasses. It's an honor of your glasses, Lynn. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, let's see. Help. This is a good one. This is Edgar. I did a reconnective session and since have several energy be beings are expressing in community and I'm not sure what I need to or have to do. Thought you could offer guidance. Um, it's in the what do you need to do? Notice them. It's a, it says help. <laughs> Yeah, I did a, sec, um, a session and several energy beings are expressing, communicating. Observe them. They're you, everyone. They're you. They're you. We are everyone. Observe yourself on the omnidirectional, omnidimensional plane. It, it's, it's all us. Uh, I'm always thankfully aware, honored, and, 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 and thrilled that I am able to witness and observe. We need not assign meaning. As soon as we assign meaning, we're already wrong. The more complicated we get about it, the more wrong we are. As soon as we think we understand everything, the more wrong we are. Observe, witness, there's a presence. Wow, isn't that cool? And if you feel so entwined, uh, so, so um, anyway, if you feel in such a mood, then, you know, set out some cookies. But, you know, just just enjoy, enjoy. <laughs> I don't know, Lynn, do you have a different take? Um, no, because he's talking about reconnective. But as you, I mean, all that I would say. Is, there that, is, there, is it really that different? No. Yeah, and right. the point is, we've seen, you know, my people have seen, we've seen a lot of energy beings or they've seen light or some sort of thing. I think it is all part of this altered state you have that, um, however you get there, you have a, essentially scales that fall. You have the limitations of your own physical experience lifted and you have extrasensory perception. And I think when you get into that place, that is who you really are. And so you're just experiencing what it is truly like to be human in all of your extended human potential. So you don't need to do anything or, or communicate with them or do anything. You just have to enjoy it. Yeah, I, I, abs absolutely. It's, it's, it's just a presence. And you know what the concept of giving, I think what's really important is, um, is that you can't, as you said, you can't give without receiving, you can't receive without giving. And the funny thing is that some of us get so involved, I'm only here to give, I only wanna give, all I wanna do is give. And we think that's giving, but really that is taking because as much as we love to give, if we only give, if we don't receive, we're denying the others involved, the other person involved with the same joy and pleasure that we have. So we must receive if we want to view ourselves as givers. Someone said is giving and receiving something that's just physical. I see that in the question, of course not. It's the flow of the universe. It's how the universe uh, metaphorically breathes in and breathes out. And even in a breathing in and a breathing out, if you observe, there is a pause. There is even a pause and a stillness. 
in that. And that's part of the beauty. That's part of the rest. That's, that's, that's part of how we, um, that's, that's really like what we consider when we do healing sessions. Some wonderful things happen overnight and show up the next day. It's the gift of the overnight. It's in that pause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to answer a question about power of eight. Does it require eight people to create a healing? No. Um, the power of eight came about by accident when I was kicking around what to do with the workshop with my husband back in 2008. And I just said, I don't know. I'll just stick people into groups of eight or so and have them send healing intention to someone with a, a health challenge, thinking it was going to be a little bit like you know, a feel good exercise. And my husband's a great headline writer. And he said, I love it, the power of eight. Now that is literally how it started. We've seen people with five, we've seen people with 12, it works with five, it works with 12. Eight is kind of a nice Goldilocks figure. Um, it's not too big, it's not too little, but it's about having a group of any size. And, you know, we see massive things um, we see healing of, of the senders during um, intention experiments. But what we do know too is more isn't necessarily better. So uh, I've done different intention experiments with big groups of you know, thousands of people and then just a hundred and have exactly the same outcome. Uh, so more isn't necessarily better, but group the group dynamic is really one part of it because as we said before you all get to be a receiver you all get to be a sender um someone else has said i have had chronic lyme disease for over 12 years i've done everything from all aspects mental emotional physical and spiritual my spirit feels fine but i still have bodily challenges wonder if you want can offer ideas any thoughts eric I could put my what doctors don't tell you hat on for that one. Can't hear you. Do that first. Do your what's doctors. Okay. Like well, um, this is in my mind right now because we're just closing an issue that is about a woman who got over Lyme disease with bee venom. And it bee venom extraordinarily enough, and there's a number of practitioners who offer this, and you don't have to get stung by a bee to do this. You can um, just get an injection, um, but bee venom has a certain element in it which counteracts the Lyme bug. So if you have a practitioner nearby, you can find one who um, offers this therapy it seems to be very, very good. There are also, you know, there are dietary and supplement type things that work, but it sounds like you've been through that whole thing. You've tried all kinds of physical things. So I would try this. But the other thing is we've had some cases of Lyme disease get healed through power of eight groups. So I would what we tend to do and talk to about talk to our groups about is if you're getting nowhere, ask the group to intend for you to find the right route, the right practitioner to heal you, the right um, diet to heal you, but primarily the right person who can who can heal you and walk you through walk you through a path to healing. So you know, the healing experience really is just that it's an experience and we grow from it what really is the right practitioner other than the person that we allow ourselves to go into a receiving mode with is it necessarily that as a catalyst for healing as the witnessing as the healing itself it has anything other to do than our willingness to be receiving and to be um 
receiving the energy light and information. So the energy light and information is experiencing itself through us. I think what we do is we set up a lot of, um, what's the word? There's, there's two words here. There, um, expectation. The, oh, thank you. That was exactly it. We set up the expectations of it should look like this. The facilitator should look like that. They should be um, trained this way. They should talk to me this way, or I should be in this certain mood, or this music should be playing, or I'm living in New York City and I hear car horns blaring. How in the world can I ever have a healing? And we set up these expectations and really there's a fine adjustment to slip from expectation into expectancy, that childlike state of, oh, well, something wonderful. And the child, when they're rip over in their Christmas presents on that morning, doesn't care if the horns are blaring or if they're living in the quiet of the country. The gifts are equally the gifts. It's the same with reconnective healing. The gift is the gift. The expectations, the attachment becomes the blockage or the interference. I don't know that we have to do something differently to be a healing as much as it, or to receive a healing as much as it might be to allow ourselves to enter into that awareness to receive, to ultimately become the healing itself. The reconnective healing is an experience. We're even calling it the reconnective healing experience, not to confuse it with the energy, light, and information. The energy, light, and information showed up first. And now every time we dive into it, mm -hmm. we have a different experience that we carry on through life. And a lot of things get set up in a way of how to do it best to receive a healing, which therefore I believe triggers a fear or an insecurity in the mind of what if I don't do it best, then I'm less than best. Will it work? How do I do it perfectly? Um, I can, you can only move three inches away from the body. Oops, what if I've moved three and a half inches away? What happens? A lot of the trying to do things perfectly could be the interference in allowing ourselves to be and become. Okay, good answer, Eric. Good answer. Um, okay, somebody, Teresa. It's blue water. Sorry? It's, it's the blue, blue water. <laughs> Teresa says, do all the people in the Power of Eight group set up their specific intentions? Because as I've said, as Lynn has said, the intention needs to be specific. Or is the healing of the sender more generic to their own needs? Because it seems you'd be more concerned with yourself as a sender in that case. Teresa, this is where true altruism comes in. It's not about the expectation of receiving. And that's why a group works and why this whole system works. Because when you're sending intention to someone else, and yes, our, uh, our work differs from Eric in this respect, in that what we found when we're putting out an, a request to the universe, we suggest it be very specific. That's what's worked over and over again in our intention experiments. So we translated that into power of eight groups. When we weren't specific, the experiments didn't get a, a positive result. So you're sending a specific intention to someone else. And that can even be to find the right practitioner for them, the practitioner that will heal them. And that's the important word, not a specific type. But what ends up happening to the sender is, yes, is more generic to their needs because they haven't asked for it. It's essentially, they. it's like Wes. Wes didn't ask to be healed. He was concentrated on trying to do the best he could for the woman with stage four cancer. And his healing came as a total surprise. It wasn't like he was doing it thinking, oh, well, now it's my turn. He was just doing it to be a good member of that community. And I think it's that, it's the getting off of yourself. And that's, I think, where we do overlap, Eric, is the getting Very off of yourself. 
is a real key element. And you can take that on many, many levels. Here's one for you, Eric. Please okay. explain how we can use reconnective healing and apply it to the predicament we're seeing in our society and democracy now. You can't in one way of phrasing it. And the other is as we receive the energy light and information, as we receive it, we're in our transformation and therefore we respond more fully, more to sort of um, misuse the word in a sense or not, holistically to a situation, whether we take it in how we vote, whether we take it in how we respond to situations instead of reacting, whether we allow, how we allow ourselves not to feel um, ruled by or victimized by something, but instead knowing how we can expand with that. But it's not that you can take reconnective healing and apply it to something specific because it will only laugh. It knows where to go, how to get there and what to do. It knows what's most appropriate. And therefore the response and what is received and the experience by each person is different. Really reconnective healing allows us to be love. It is us as love. And love needs no direction, needs no technique, needs no how do I do this or that. Love is. Reconnective healing, energy, light, and information is. We are. And in that, we stop doing in that we stop doing and we are and being in that existence there is the vulnerability of openness of sharing of unveiling our souls even ourself to ourself but there is no risk no danger and maybe that's why in reconnective healing there are no protections because there are simply none needed. Darkness is a lack of light. It's a void. It's not something to protect itself from. It's an absence of. And anywhere where we feel that we need protection from, what's really happening is that it's the illusion that we are in danger. We are never unsafe. Safety need not even be considered. Okay, very good, very good answer. I should let everybody know that um, I'm running an intention experiment um, to help quiet a lot of the violence, unrest, protest, et cetera, going on in America at the moment and the, out, the polarization is, um, as a result of the election. And we're going to be having both Democrats and Republicans on with me um, to be healed and to connect with each other. And what we've found when we've done uh, experiments like that, using um, a, a focus like Jerusalem, and we had on both um, uh, people from various Arab cities, plus an audience full of Israeli Jews, and by the end of it, the Jews were saying, I love you to the Arabs. The Arabs were saying, your God is my God. And everybody was having a, a love fest. So we're going to do that. And interestingly, Lisa on our chat said that she was part of a group intention <clears throat> to do just this, to heal political groups in America. And she said she got very angry right after that. She felt intense anger and thought, well, that didn't do anything for me, but make me mad as hell. Well, as of today, I don't get angry at, at things in my life as I did before. I have immense peace in my heart. And when a situation happens that I've always, that I have always become angry over before, nothing happens to me, no reaction at all. I'm amazed at my healing. Thanks to Lynn, thanks to Lynn. Anyway, 
this is what happens to us all the time. It's almost like the target is immaterial. I think it's the act of participation that heals the heart. So I beautiful. That, I, you should say that again. The target is immaterial. The mm -hmm. target is immaterial. The target causes us to focus. And when we focus, we limit the picture. When we relieve, let go of that target, allow it to be immaterial, love becomes the whole picture. That was beautiful, Lynn. Absolutely. And that's the thing that carries on in the lives of the participants. And I think that's what goes on in a power of eight group too, is their lives become healed, the, whether it's they're a sender, they're a receiver. And as you say, what we're really talking about is this experience of oneness, which is what love is. And that's what we both witness over and over again, which is the real healer. Um, I'm just going to answer, somebody asked about whether uh, my work is in Spanish. It is, and we, I'm about to do an online course that will be translated into Spanish. So um, please stay tuned. Um, we will be putting up information about our intention experiment. Um, let's see. You know, I, I was going to mention. That was important for Sorry. you, Eric. Go ahead. Well, I was going to mention, by the way, that, um, you know, we've got, because you had mentioned community before, and it's so vital. We have what's called the RLC, the Reconnective Life Community, where um, people join. Actually, they can join for the first month for free if you just want to come visit us and see what's happening, where we have um, live and learn sessions. We, um, where we get together, we do question and answer. Um, and we chat so we can talk with each other, sometimes voice to voice, sometimes in the chat lines. We've got uh, retreats that we do with that. We have Reconnective Yoga on Saturdays. Um, we've um, a, a lot of different fun things, global stay at home. We're gonna have a global stay at home virtual weekend uh, retreat um, in February, I think the first weekend in February or so a lot of ways for us to get together. Community is so important to nurture and in that we can ask the questions that maybe we didn't have time to ask, like when you and I are doing things and people are you know, in the chat lines and um, we can speak and we can be heard and we can feel the healing and the love um, in that presence. And um, I, I think there's just so much to be gained it's infinite. And a lot of people are doing things with, with healing tonight. I mean, Lee Carroll, you know, Lee and Monica Cryon um, are doing their Circle of 12 Healing Wednesdays and um, on January 27th, Jillian is going to be um, a guest there. I think it's very important now, part I, of, I think, the gift, one of the gifts of this COVID experience, meaning, you know, it's a phase. Um, we may be changed from it. We may not completely, we won't completely go back to the world the way it is, but it's wonderful evolution in it, is that a lot of us who have been doing so much individual teaching or teaching just in small groups are reaching out and being able to share more um, about healing and evolution and our studies and let our audiences who just follow one of us go to every Lynn gathering, every Eric gathering, every this gathering, every whatever, to um, experience and share and discover more and find that where sometimes things look like opposites or conflicts. They were really expansions. It's sort of like, I, as I talk about sometimes with techniques they tend to focus in on this that or the other and they're kind of like windows like often our our religions are a window we see everything through the window of one religion or something and then we get brave and we look out a second window and we find that it's not in conflict that it's a bigger part of the picture we can't see from in our house and even if we look out of every window we can't see the whole picture until we walk outside because every picture is limited by the window frame which is limited by the wall that holds the frame we've got to go outside and suddenly realize it's not conflict it's, it's all one, it, it's all one. Sorry, Absolutely, I thought about that. Eric. 
No, and as you say, maybe one of the gifts, one of the things that we found, and it's funny because uh, I started doing masterclass groups in, in uh, 2015, mainly just to see what would happen if I put people into groups, taught them, and observed them over a year with everything in their lives begin to heal. So it was, it was investigative curiosity more than anything else. And, you know, when people met regularly, pretty much 100% experienced major changes. And, you know, we've seen that with extraordinary events with the masterclass that is just about finished now. We start, we kick off our new one on February 6th. Um, you know, we had a guy who had weeks to live, had cancer that was supposedly disseminated, and he went in for his operation to get both legs amputated. And after his group's healing uh, intention for him, a continual he healing intention, when they went in to operate, um, they found the cancer was encapsulated. They could easily remove it, and he kept his legs. But, you know, we had other kinds of stories, too, and it was about commitment and meeting. So it was about community of the people who met week after week after week. But they always, from the start, met virtually. So one of the things that I found, and I have my own Power of Eight group, is the meeting virtually has been a godsend over this time of isolation, being able to know you've got this little group, this, uh, this intention family, or a big group in the case of Eric's community where you can connect with is so extraordinarily healing. So I'm gonna end this also by letting you, you know my new Power of Eight Intention Masterclass. You'll read about it on these feeds. Um, you can find out about it on my website, lynnmctaggart.com. It's kicking off February 6th. If you want your own Power of Eight group, instruction from me, and um, uh, a year-long extraordinary transformational experience with your own community, please check that out. We're also set, we've just set up our own community site for people who are tired of Facebook. We will have our own community site where you can connect with other groups, set up your own. We have Connecting and Healing Through the Power of Eight, a Facebook group that is designed for people to set up Power of Eight groups. And also um, beside this Sunday's intention experiment, and you can find out that it'll be in the chat of this Facebook page. So if you wanna join, that's going to be 10 a.m. Pacific, Sunday, January 17th. Um, the final thing I want to tell you about is a new television web channel that I'm going to be running. We'll have one for what doctors don't tell you. You'll hear the news about COVID and other things you can't hear anywhere else. And you'll also have conversations with me, in-depth conversations like this all the time. So check it out, lynnmctaggart.com. Dr. Pearl, remind them where to find you. Sure. Um, I know there are questions coming in. Will you be in Russia? Will we be teaching it in Russian? If you go to the website, it's thereconnection.com. Thereconnection.com. You'll find that we've got um, training programs all around the world. I think the first thing you probably want to start with is called the portal because it's online. You can take it at your own pace. Each hour of the portal has 10 minutes on one topic. 12 minutes on another, eight on something else. There are exercises, philosophy, science, concepts, things you can do with Jillian and I teaching that all the way through beautifully laid out. So you don't have to ever set aside an hour here, an hour there. You can just do a few minutes here and there. This year we're going into the concept of new year, new you. We are each um, the recognition of our own infinite nature as well as our life experience um, becoming one isn't an experience, it's, it's who we are. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend this new year investigating the knowingness of our true nature as God, as love, as the intelligence of the universe by whatever name you want so that we can flourish on our own. If you come join us at the Reconnective Life community, you know, the first month is absolutely free. Um, it'll include Reconnective Yoga, 
Um, uh, our, it'll include some other things. We have every Tuesday a town hall question and answer meeting. Um, we have Solomon study groups for the, and Solomon speaks on reconnecting your life. The book of some channel material. We have the live and learns with Jillian, um, all sorts of fun things. So go to thereconnection.com, find out all about us, ask us questions. Yes, the book is in 40 languages. Yes, we'll be doing training programs um, all around. The one in the United States will be in May um, in New York. Great. Thank you, Eric. And yes, you'll probably see us in person as soon as they lighten up on lockdown. Right. So thank you, everybody, for attending thereconnection.com, lynnmctaggart.com. We hope to see you there. Take care, stay well, stay safe. Thanks so much. And thank you, Eric. Thank you, Lynn, so much. It was a pleasure seeing you. It was great. All righty. Goodbye, everybody.